Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to cloud data storage in Domain 2 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the second of five videos for Domain 2. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a teeny tiny part of our complete CCSP masterclass. We're going to start with a bunch of fundamental concepts related to storing data in the cloud, including types of storage, controllers, and clusters. Then we'll discuss these in relation to the major service models. We'll end the mind map by going through the major threats to storage that you need to know about. So let's dive in by talking about this major types of storage that we have access to in the cloud. Starting with the two major types of virtual storage that we have access to. And what I mean by virtual here is that as a customer, we're not getting direct access to any sort of physical storage device like a hard drive. Put another way, we are not being assigned any dedicated hardware. Instead, we're accessing types of virtual storage. A volume is an emulation of a hard drive. A volume is a virtual hard drive. Volume storage is often referred to as block storage, and it works just like your traditional physical hard drive. The operating system manages the file system and a volume is attached as a storage device for cloud instances like virtual machines. So think of a volume as a virtual hard drive for your virtual machine. Object storage is very different. There is no emulation of hardware here. Instead, object storage is essentially a simplification of storage. Object storage stores data as objects in a flat namespace. Each object includes the data itself, metadata, and a unique identifier. Object storage is typically accessed by APIs, application programming interfaces, rather than being attached as a virtual hard drive to a VM. Object storage is designed to handle massive amounts of unstructured data. Think S3 buckets or Azure, Azure blob storage. These are examples of object storage. A content delivery network, a CDN, is a distributed network of servers that deliver content to users based on their geographic location, ensuring faster load times and reducing server load by caching content physically close to the user's location. CDNs are closely linked to object storage in the cloud. Typically, object storage is the primary repository for large amounts of unstructured data, and the CDN accelerates the delivery of this data by caching it at the edge locations closer to the users improving performance and reducing latency. Think AWS CloudFront or Akamai as examples of CDNs, content distribution networks. Long-term storage is designed for storing data that needs to be retained over, you guessed it, a long period of time. Examples include backups, archives, and compliance data. Long-term storage solutions are optimized for durability and cost efficiency rather than speed. Ephemeral storage refers to the temporary storage that exists only for the duration of a session or instance. When the instance is terminated or stopped, the data stored in ephemeral storage is lost. It disappears into the ether. Poof, gone forever. So ephemeral storage is temporary storage attached to a VM or something else. Raw disk storage refers to storage volumes directly attached to a virtual machine or physical server. Raw disk storage gives low-level access to the disk, allowing full control for custom configurations and greater performance. Raw disk is essentially a dedicated physical hard drive to a specific customer. This is going to be a lot more expensive. However, it can be useful for applications that require disk access for performance reasons, such as database systems or where users need to manage partitions and file systems themselves. So raw disk is essentially where a customer gets a dedicated physical hard drive. Okay, now let's talk about a cool way that data can be stored in the cloud through fragmentation and dispersion, also commonly referred to as bit splitting. Fragmentation refers to the process of breaking down large files into smaller pieces or fragments, which are stored separately across a storage system. This is commonly done to optimize space or speed up access. Dispersion refers to the process of spreading or distributing data across different locations or nodes. Dispersion can provide redundancy, security, and improve performance. 
the, the basic idea here is that when you save a file to the cloud, the cloud provider systems will fragment the file into a number of fragments and then disperse these fragments across multiple storage nodes. And this can provide greater speed and redundancy and so forth. There are two algorithms that you need to know about that can perform this fragmentation and dispersion. The first is called secret sharing made short. The SSMS algorithm will first divide a file into multiple fragments or shares. These shares are then distributed across different cloud servers or storage systems. A predefined a threshold of shares are required to reconstruct the original data. If fewer than the threshold number of shares are accessed, no useful information can be gleaned from the individual fragments. So in other words, in order to reconstruct your original file, you need some a certain number of the fragments back. You, you can handle losing a few of them, but not obviously all of the fragments. And by distributing these shares across different servers or geographical locations, SSMS protects against data breaches. As an attacker, we need to access multiple cloud services simultaneously to retrieve the full data. SSMS is particularly useful for key management or storing highly sensitive data, ensuring that no individual piece of data is useful by itself. It also minimizes overhead by making it more efficient to store data in the cloud. AONT-RS, all or nothing transformed by Reed Solomon, that rolls off the tongue nicely, uh, combines two key technologies to both secure and make cloud data storage more resilient. All or nothing transform is a cryptographic transform that ensures that data is broken down into multiple fragments where each piece is essential. Without all of the pieces, no useful information can be retrieved, making, it, making data harder to attack. That's why it's called all or nothing. You need all the fragments back in order to reconstruct the data. Read Solomon coding adds error correction to the data fragments. If some of the fragments are lost or corrupted due to server outage or hardware failure, RS coding allows the original data to be reconstructed using the remaining fragments. All the data is fragmented and protected. These pieces are distributed across multiple cloud platforms or locations. This makes it virtually impossible for hackers to retrieve the complete data without access to all the pieces, while also ensuring the data can be recovered even if the fragments are missing. These are cool algorithms. Okay, moving on to storage controllers which are hardware devices or software components that manage data flow between a computer system and storage devices, such as hard drives, SSDs, and storage arrays. Storage controllers act as an interface between the server and the physical storage media. Storage controller performs such tasks as data caching, RAID management, and handling read-write error uh, and read-write operations. Let's now talk about three protocols that can be used by storage controllers to move data around. iSCSI, the Internal Small Computer Systems Interface, is a protocol that enables the transmission of SCSI commands over a TCP IP network, allowing you to access storage devices over a standard Ethernet connection. iSCSI does not support encryption, so other protocols, for example, IPsec, must be used to encrypt the iSCSI traffic. Fiber Channel is a high-speed networking technology used to connect systems to storage devices in a SAN, a storage area network. Fiber Channel offers dedicated, lossless, high bandwidth communication. As the name Fiber Channel suggests, fiber optic connections are used. So this is an expensive but very high-speed connection. Fiber Channel over Ethernet, FCOE, encapsulates fiber channel traffic within Ethernet frames allowing fiber channel traffic to run over a standard Ethernet network, enabling network convergence. Fiber channel over Ethernet is commonly used to consolidate storage and network traffic infrastructure, reducing the need for a separate cable and switches for fiber channel and Ethernet traffic. We'll talk about uh, convergence more later on in a future mind map. The next topic is storage clusters. A storage cluster is a group of networked storage devices or servers that work together to provide a unified storage solution. Clusters enhance data availability, scalability, and fault tolerance by distributing data across multiple nodes. In a tightly coupled cluster, nodes or storage servers or devices are closely connected and share memory or a really high speed interconnect. They often operate as a single system. Tightly coupled systems typically have really low latency and high speed communication between nodes. Tightly coupled clusters are going to be more expensive, 
but they provide very high performance and low latency storage. Loosely coupled clusters are essentially the opposite. They consist of nodes that are relatively independent and communicate over a network with less frequent interaction. They do not share memory and have higher latency in communication. If performance and low latency aren't critical, you can save some money and use a loosely coupled cluster and have the additional benefit of being easier to scale. Here's a diagram that depicts the difference between tightly and loosely coupled clusters. Tightly coupled clusters offer performance with a higher cost. Loosely coupled clusters have lower performance at lower cost and are easier to scale. Okay, now let's talk through which of these different storage options we have access to by service model. We'll start with software as a service. It's really simple. In software as a service, we have access to none of these storage options. SaaS means you are simply renting access to someone else's application. You have zero control over the architecture of the software and what storage solution is being used on the back end. The major way that we have access to storage in software solution applications is simply through a web interface. We can perhaps upload some files through the web interface or enter some data through forms and we can download files or view data, but we have zero visibility or control over how the data is being stored on the back end. Moving on to platform as a service, we now have some options. We are building our own custom application. You can define how that application stores data. Depending on what sort of data you're storing, you could choose to store your data in a structured format, nice and neat columns and rows, like in a table, in a database, or in unstructured format, such as text files, images, and videos. If you're building an application, you can choose to connect it to a database. PaaS environments will offer managed relational databases where structured data is stored in tables with predefined schemas, often accessed through SQL structured query language. No SQL storage solutions are another option that are designed to handle large volumes of unstructured or semi-structured data. There's also big data storage solutions that are designed to manage and process massive data sets, often involving parallel processing and distributed storage. The final option we'll discuss here is the aforementioned object storage. Your application can store its unstructured data as objects. This solution is ideal for storing large amounts of unstructured data, such as images, videos, backups, and archives. All right, moving on again, we arrive at infrastructure as a service. This is where we have the most options by far. You have access to volume storage. Remember, a volume is essentially a virtual hard drive you can attach to one or more and you can attach one or more volumes to a virtual machine. You also have access to object storage. Another option is raw disk storage. Raw disk, remember, is going to be more expensive, but may be cost justified depending on the requirements. Ephemeral storage is temporary storage that exists only for the duration of a session or instance. You have access to that. Finally, you also have access to various types of databases. To sum it up, you have access to all the options in infrastructure as a service because you have so much more control over the virtual environment. Alrighty, let's move on to discuss some common threats to storage. None of these threats are unique to the cloud, but some of these threats are exacerbated in the cloud, so you definitely need to be thinking about them. Unauthorized usage is where cloud resources, such as storage, are used without permission. It could result in overconsumption of resources, leading to unexpected costs or reduced performance for legitimate users. Unauthorized access is where cloud storage is accessed without permission. This can result in the exposure of sensitive data, data integrity issues, or even deletion of important data. You want to carefully control who has access to data in the cloud. As you've likely seen by almost daily data breaches in the cloud, it's relatively easy to misconfigure settings and expose your data to the world. Regulatory non-compliance is failing to comply with regulations, such as GDPR or HIPAA. The consequences can be legal penalties, such as fines. Regulatory bodies require specific controls for data security, retention, and privacy, which must be adhered to even when you're storing data in the cloud. Denial of service is the threat where an attacker seeks to make a system, or in this case some data, unavailable to its intended users by temporarily or indefinitely disrupting services. This can prevent access to data or applications and affect service continuity. Theft or accidental loss is the threat where data is stored in the cloud 
can be accidentally deleted or lost due to human error or infrastructure failures. Additionally, data can be stolen if proper security measures are not in place. Malware is malicious software, such as ransomware or viruses, which can infect cloud storage, encryption, or corrupt your data. This can happen through insecure APIs, user devices, or compromised credentials. And the result can be data corruption, loss, and ransomware demands, leading to financial losses and downtime. Lastly, but certainly not least, this is important, no sanitization or lack of proper sanitization is where sensitive data is not properly removed or destroyed to prevent it from being recovered. For example, if a hard drive fails and is not securely disposed of, then someone could recover sensitive data from the failed drive. If you're storing sensitive data in the cloud, it's important to understand your cloud provider's data sanitization processes and ensure they meet your organization's requirements. All right, that's it for the mind map on cloud data storage in domain two, covering many of the most essential topics you need to know for the exam.